So I, I'm going to continue in English, uh, so that because what, one of the purpose is to be pedagogical, so that some people that work in the selfish mining problems uh, understand this subtle uh, probability situation, uh, and 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 this, this, the, the results that we that we present here show exactly where is the misunderstanding. So uh, to start with, uh, in the selfish mining community, the first papers were using a tool that is called Markov chains. And I think we were the first ones to use martingales. That is a different tool in probability. And, and there is a very good reason for use martingales because there are some results that you cannot prove just using Markov chains and you need to use martingales. This is why martingales were invented. So I'm going to be I'm going to give you an introduction for the motivation of martingales first, okay? So first I, I'm going to explain what martingales achieve that you cannot achieve with other tools like uh, Markov chains. Uh, so this is the, f the first things, and then I will, I will start talking about Bitcoin and, and mining and, and selfish mining strategies, etc. So, uh, well, the name martingale is a mathematical theory. It's a, it's a, it's a part of probability. And the name comes from the roulette martingale. What is the roulette martingale? Well, this is a winning strategy for roulette. Uh, and if it really worked, the casinos would be broke. And indeed it works, because you do the following. So, uh, so you know how to play the roulette, right? You can bet on the numbers, or you can bet on, on, on black or red. Okay? And there's a special number zero, that if, if, the, if the, in the roulette you, you get zero, the house get all the money. Well, you can also bet on the zero, but let's put this aside. But essentially, the, the house has an edge because it has, it has 36 numbers and there is a zero that gives the edge to the house. And so you can bet on columns, on, well, there are plenty of combinations to bet. But the simplest one is to bet uh, so uh, red or, or black. So the, there, are, there are exactly 18 red numbers and 18 black numbers. And so you. I propose to play in the following way. I always, I'm going always to bet on red, okay? And uh, so I start with betting, let's say, one euro, or whatever basic unit I can, minimal unit I can bet. And if I win, I win. So I, I get one euro. The, the payout is always uh, uh, what, what you bet for black and, and red. Of course, if, if, you, if, you get, if you get zero, then you, you lose, right? So you have a higher chances to lose than to, than to win. But you do the following. Every time, if you, if you lose, next time, instead of betting one, you bet two. Okay? If you win, then you win two. It means that uh, from the starting point, you have won one euro. Okay? Because you, 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 you lost one and you win two. So this is, this is the the win that you have is, is, is one, one lose. This is the corresponding to the sequence lose win. Now, if you lose a second time, you are going to bet four. You doubled your bet. OK? And then what happens if next time you win? Imagine that you lose one time, you lose another time, and you win. Then you will have minus two, minus, minus one, minus two, plus four is what you win. So you win one. OK? Plus one. Plus one. Now, if you lose a third time, so you bet once, you lose. You bet twice, you lose. You, every time you double the bet, you bet three times, you lose, and then you win. What is the outcome? Would be one, minus one, minus two, minus four, and then you win. It's plus eight, so it's plus one. Okay. So this is this corresponds to this this sequence, and so on. So you see that you always win. You only need to double up every time you lose, all right? So what's the trick? You need an infinite amount of money for sure. Yeah, but then this never happens, right? If I, if, I, if I bet 10 times, I'm going to win one, right? Well, <laughs> I remember I was a child and my uncle was telling me, oh, you know, you can make money this way. I say, no, no, you can. Ah, but that's impossible, 10 times. And then he went to the casino. And, and, and he was recording the numbers. And that night, there was uh, you know, a, a, a red or a black 12 times, which is extremely rare. 
But anyway, the main problem is not this, is that the main problem is that, of course, there are table limits. The casinos, you cannot bet an infinite amount. Of course, you, you will have a problem of having a lot of money to bet, because each time it doubles, right? So if you, if you lose many times, you have to bet a big amount just to recover everything and, and to win one, one euro, okay? Up to my knowledge, they block you if they understand that you're applying No, no, they love that. No, no, they, they, won't lock, they won't block you. They will block you in the table limit. They, they compute the table limit for that. No, no, they, they are happy that people do that. These are people, and there are people that do that, that go every night to the casino, they win a small amount, and they go back home with a small amount, but the day they lose, they lose everything that they have <laughs> bet. And this is, this, is what, this is the problem. And now you can look at this strategy and you can compute, well, I mean, if there is a table limit, what is the expected value, okay? Uh, so th then, then, of course, this strategy cannot work if there's a table limit, because if you lose several times, you, you can no longer bet the same way, so you stop. Essentially, you decide to do the strategy, you are going to bet in this way until you reach the table limit, and if you reach the table limit, then you stop, and then you lose a big amount. And then what is the expected value? Uh, well, you just do the computation, it's very simple, and you will see that uh, the, the expected value uh, of this strategy is negative, okay? Okay, so far it's very elementary. You can do the little computation in function of the table limit that allows you to double up uh, n times, right? And, and, and do the, the computation. Now, you can change this strategy and say, well, okay, instead of, uh, of, uh, of betting two times what I, what, I, what I lost, I'm going to bet, uh, let's say, one and a half times. So if I, if I lose one time, next time I'm going to bet 1.5. Okay, expecting to recover part of it, etc. Okay, so, so, so you can change your strategy with the same principles, but you can change the, the algorithm, right? And then, then for each algorithm you can compute and you will see that you have a negative expected value. But how do you prove that there is no algorithm of betting a strategy of this sort, just increasing the bet each time you, you lose in order to make it profitable. This is a non-trivial problem. It looks obvious, right? Because you will say, well, you know, the house has an edge, it has a zero. So, so every time you play, uh, the house has an edge over you. So it won't, you know, it's, it's, it won't be logical that, that you find an algorithm to, to beat the house if the house has an edge. And this is the fact is, is true. But how you prove it? And there is no other way, that, as far as I know, there's no other way of proving it than using martingales. Okay? This is why martingales were invented. Because with martingales, you can prove, you can prove that there's an infinite number of different strategies and no, no strategy will work. Okay? So, so I, I tell you, the, the, the answer is intuitively clear that is no. And someone that is not very mathematically sophisticated will say, oh, of course, this is obvious. Bullshit. I mean, it's obvious because you are ignorant. You, you don't know what is a mathematical proof. I mean, of course, it's obvious ev to prove that every strategy, every particular strategy is, has a negative expected value. But it's not obvious how to prove that there is no, on this infinite number of, of, of different strategies, that none, none of them is profitable. Okay? So this is, this is the point that I want to insist that people miss in, in this field of selfish mining. They don't understand what's going on. They see, well, I'm, I'm going to, to go into it. So only in a way is martingale theory. So if you want, okay, this is a very simple and elementary example, but of course this, this martingale theory is used for more sophisticated things, and in particular for, for the selfish mining problems that we are going to discuss. Now, uh, so just I come back to, to cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin. Uh, well, I mean, I just remind a few things that, that should be obvious and well known for people in the audience, but uh, uh, just to remind that the main principle of decentralization is that the protocol rules... Oh, sorry, you don't have questions about this, it's okay? About what I talk about the Martingale, it's okay, right? In case if you have questions, let me know. So, uh, Okay, so the, principle, the main principle of decentralization is that the protocol rules are aligned with individual interests uh, of agents in the network. So it means that if someone does not respect the rules 
in the network is, is, go, is not going to be profitable. The most profitable strategy should be the honest one, so following the rules. And this, this main principle is really necessary because uh, no one supervises a decentralized network. Okay? So it's just, it's just the economic incentives that warranty that people behave properly. There is no police, okay? There is no one that punishes misbehavior. And what happens is that if someone misbehaves, then he punishes himself by an economic cost. Because following the rules should be more profitable than just trying to cheat the rules. And I, the, the most famous example is double spend attacks. I mean, you can always try a double spend attack, but uh, it's not profitable. Uh, I mean, of course, unless you have a, a massive hash rate that is over 50%. And, uh, you know, it's very costly to reverse. I mean, in, in order to do a double spend attack, you, you must reverse uh, a, confirm, uh, a transaction that has been confirmed. So you have to replace blocks. The, the last blocks in the in the blockchain, and this costs a lot. So just for one block with one confirmation. So at the time we wrote the paper, now now it's much more than 50 million. To reverse one 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 confirmation, you you need to risk to have 15 million US dollars at hand. So now it's probably around 40 40 million dollars. So unless you double spend for that amount, it's not interesting. Uh, now. Um, Another example that is the topic of the talk is uh, the rule that says that mi miners uh, should release the blocks as soon as they of the found they validate the blocks, uh, and and this is this is intuitively clear but wrong that uh, uh, well the main incentive for miners is to validate a block and to release it as soon as possible before another miner finds the block and invalidates your block. But precisely, this type of rule has a flaw. And this is, this is what people realize, and this is called selfish mining, is that you, you mine a block, and maybe you, you, you have a strategies where you can keep the block hidden and keep mining on top of this block, and, and expect or hope that the, that the other miners do not uh, you, you get an advantage there, right, with respect to the other miners. You are mining one block ahead, and you expect to be ahead of them. Uh, and, and of course, you can keep ahead of them if you, your hash rate is larger than 50% uh, in general. You have the expectation to keep ahead, but if not, it's not true. But well, you can, you can analyze the situation, and this is, this is called selfish mining and block withholding attacks. There are different methods, and this has a Long history, indeed. Already, people were discussing this type of attack in 2010 in the Bitcoin Talk Forum, and notably, our Hornings is a user that opened a thread on this, and people were discussing this. I mean, not not a very rigorous way. Then also, uh, Rosenfeld mentioned this in in his uh, preprint in 2011, and then Aaron Sirer uh, wrote a paper in 2013. Precisely doing a mathematical theory with Markov chains to prove that this could be profitable. Okay? And well, even at the time they exaggerated, they were claiming that Bitcoin is broken, etc. But it's not true, really. Uh, but this attack exists. And uh, at the same time, there was another paper or Bahak. Theoretical Bitcoin attacks with less than half of the computational power that deals about the same topic. And then further, there were papers on different types. This was just a precise algorithm. I mean, how to keep the blocks and release them at the right moment. But you have to decide when you release. You release the block when if you have an advantage. And you release the block when the, the official blockchain has the same number of blocks than you. Or before, you don't let them to reach the same number of blocks. So so you, you keep an advantage of one, but you can, you can do other things. Or you can even let the official blockchain uh, advance your chain and hope to recover. So there are different types of strategies, like for betting on the roulette. You have uh, just a, an infinite number of possible strategies to selfish mining. 
Now, uh, what we, we did in 2018 was uh, to analyze the selfish mining from the profitability point of view and with martingales. Okay? And I'm going to discuss what is the difference, what, what we introduce, and what makes the difference with the previous uh, analysis is that uh, so the Yarsir paper proposed a model with barcom chain with a, with a precise algorithm of selfish mining. Okay, so they proved that this algorithm, if you have a certain number of hash rates and there is another parameter that is called the connection, how, how well is your node connected, how, how quick you can spread your block on the network, okay, to fight a, a competing block. Okay, so, so in function of this the hash rate and this connecting parameter, you can decide you can, compute, you can decide if this strategy is profitable or not. Okay? Now, but they don't really have a, a, a correct profitability model. What they are looking is to have a higher percentage of blocks in the blockchain. And this is a wrong point of view. It's not because you have a higher percentage of blocks in the blockchain that you are making this algorithm profitable. Because if you just slow down the blockchain in such a way that it's very slow, and I mean, the profitability is about making money per unit of time. A miner, what he wants is not, is not to, to fill the blockchain with all his blocks, but it's just to, to get an income, to maximize the income at the end of the month. Okay? So this is the point that this Markov chain analysis misses. One of the points that it misses is that the profitability model is wrong. You don't want to maximize the number, the percentage of number of blocks in the blockchain, but you want to maximize uh, the revenue that you get from mining per month or per week or per day. Okay? And I mean, at the end, it could be the same because you know what happens is that if you do a, a strategy that slows down the blockchain, then after 2016 blocks, there's a difficulty adjustment. So usually 2016 blocks, it means two weeks. But if the blockchain is slowed down, it could be six months, for example. So it might take a very long time to be profitable. So this is the main point that we discuss in our paper. So we, we fix this uh, profitability model. And, and really, they do not understand these authors and, and many others that cite them that uh, selfish mining is an attack on the difficulty adjustment algorithm. Because indeed, it exploits the difficulty adjustment algorithm. And this is, this is what we, we prove the profitability model. We really, we really make clear, the picture was clear, that you are attacking this difficulty adjustment algorithm. And you can uh, uh, indeed, uh, once you understand what's wrong in the, in the protocol, you can fix it. So there are different ways to fix that. Okay, we propose a certain number of ways to fix that. And uh, so what we prove really, and, and th these other people before didn't, didn't realize or didn't care to, to, to understand that, uh, that the attack is really on the difficulty adjustment algorithm. And, the really, the, the, in the paper, is the first time that uh, that uh, that we we point out the origin of the attack, the, the flaw in the in the protocol. Okay, so let me explain a little bit this. Okay. Now, uh, a consequence of that is that there is no profitable selfish mining without a difficulty adjustment. So imagine that you don't have a difficulty adjustment. Okay, just always mine the blocks with the same difficulty. And uh, so of course, if the global hash rate is lower, it will take longer to mine blocks. If it's higher, it will go faster. And if, if it goes very fast, it can create problems of synchronization in the network. This is why Satoshi really choose 10 minutes and not, not 10 seconds, right? 10 seconds will be problematic because you, you need to spread the new, blo the new block across all the, all the network. Now, uh, so what we prove using Martingale techniques, and this is, this is something that you cannot prove with, with Markov chain. I mean, you can, you can prove with one, that one particular algorithm of selfish mining will not be profitable with, without, with, with no difficulty adjustment, but you cannot prove that any uh, block withholding algorithm is not profitable. And this is why, why where you need Martingales. 
It's just to prove that. So, so if there is no difficulty adjustment, then there is no profitable selfish mining or block withholding. So, so this, this is nice because it means that the honest strategy of releasing the blocks immediately is optimal for the miners. So this is what the, the protocol dictates. And, and this is nice. Indeed, the, the, the protocol will be nicer without that difficulty adjustment. But of course, we need that difficulty adjustment because we are in a... See, if, if we were in a steady state where the hash rate was stable, that would be fine to not have a difficulty adjustment because you don't care to have a block every 10 minutes or every 12 minutes or every 8 minutes. But if the hash rate grows and it grows very fast because the ecosystem, the Bitcoin ecosystem, so I'm talking about Bitcoin, but of course this, this is, all this analysis is for, for any, only, only blocks, any blockchain with a proof of work. Uh, so if the, if the ecosystem grows, the hash rate grows, and then you need, you need a difficulty adjustment just to make sure that you, don't, you are not going to get blocks every 10 seconds and get into trouble of synchronization. There are other problems. But anyway, this is a mathematical theorem. And, and as far as I know, this cannot be proved without martingales. And then, you know, we, we got some referee reports of people not understanding what's going on, saying, oh, no, but this is obvious because if you do selfish mining, you will obtain a higher percentage of block in the blockchain. I don't care. If your blockchain is slows down and doesn't progress, you may get 100% of the blocks and, and, and get broke in, in, in six months. You see? Because, you know, these strategies have a, a serious drawback, and this is why they are really not dangerous for Bitcoin, is that it, it takes time. Because, indeed, doing this block withholding strategy, what you do is you slow down the blockchain. And then, then it's not profitable for anyone. You, you, you hit the profitability of the honest miners, but also you hit your, prof your own profitability. And it only becomes profitable when the difficulty adjustment hits and lowers the difficulty. Then it becomes profitable. And then you need to recover everything you have spent, and it takes long time, it takes several months to, to, to get any of these algorithms profitable. Okay. So this, this is what I was telling you, that without a constant uh, difficulty, a cost, with a constant difficulty, with no difficulty adjustment, there is no possible to obtain higher profitabilities. And, and this, is, this is what the Markov chain does, is the analog of what I described here at the beginning. You know, you have a fixed algorithm and you can compute things and you say, well, the expected value is negative. And this is what they do. You just they look at, at a fixed strategy and say, well, the expected value is negative. Okay, so indeed, indeed, in this case, uh, you, the, 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 you know, with the, the, the only thing they can prove as part of the theory is, is that in any algorithm, if you don't have a difficulty adjustment, the expected value is negative. But they cannot prove that any strategy has negative expected value. And of course, this is just not a mathematical point. Of course, yeah, they say, well, I mean, you know, then you get referees in these computer science guys that don't understand what is a, a mathematical proof, and they say, well, this is formal mathematics bullshit. This is, this is really true mathematics. I mean, you, you, you are able to prove that there is no algorithm at all or not. And if you want to prove that there is no algorithm at all, it's not just looking one by one because there is an infinite number. So you need to use other tools and Markov chain. Okay? So this is the key point. Now, let, let's go into, into the profitability analysis, because this is, this is the point that, that people usually are missing. Uh, this is, they don't understand what, what we, we are doing with Martin Gales, is that uh, profit and loss at time t. So, you, you know, any miner has a revenue that comes from the block that he has mined and get validated in the blockchain, so you get the block reward, plus maybe fees, etc. And uh, then this is the cost. So the cost is complicated because it, it means that it's, it's cost on material, hardware for mining, it's cost on facilities, it's cost on people that run the facilities, it's cost on energy, electricity, you know, and sometimes, you know, just, just hardware and, and stuff to get the electricity, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's very complicated. C of T is very costly. The cost is very complicated, depends very much on the operation. But the revenue is very simple, it's just you count the number, you look at time t, the number of blocks you, have, you are able to validate. So these are what is called, you know, these are 
and not a mathematical audience, 100%. This is a random variable. So it, it means R of t, you know, is, uh, is the revenue at time t, but of course, it has a probability of having one value or another. Okay, so this, this, these both things are random variables. C of t is also have a random variable. The price of electricity is not predictable, it's not constant. So, you know, these are vari random variables. And, and the profit and loss in any business is look, you look at the profit and loss at time t. Okay, so these time considerations are, are very important. And what is important is, is the profit and loss by unit of time. So, this ratio, how much you make by, by minute by second, by hour, okay? This is, this is what is important. Not how many blocks or what percentage of blocks you are putting in the blockchain, but how much money are you making by unit of time? I mean, when, when you apply for a job, you look for a monthly salary or year salary. You don't look for a salary in the abstract. They say, well, you know, I will pay you $1 million, but uh, it's not the same as they pay you $1 million in one year or in 10 years, right? So, okay, so let's, let's be clear on that. And so what is important is this asymptotic, this limit when t goes to infinite at the beginning, you know, even for these uh, different Deviant strategies, you can, you can have a different revenue. And, but then at the, in the long run, you, you, need, you, you want to understand in the long run what's going on. So this is, this is the profit of, at loss and infinite. Now, one key observation is that, of course, if we try to compute C of t is very complicated, we won't be able. And there are some papers that people try to compute this, but this, this is complicated, you know? But the key observation is that whatever strategy you use, the cost of mining is the same. So we are assuming that you run your operation at full, okay, you are having all the machines that are running. So it doesn't matter, I mean, it's just a question of when do you release the blocks. But, but the cost is going to be the same. You are going to mine with your hardware, with all the, the highest hash rate that you can, because you know that it's going to be the maximum profitability is where, where you, you run with a maximum hash rate. And if you mine honestly and you release the blocks instantly or, or you, 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 you withhold the blocks, the cost of producing blocks is the same. C of T is the same for any strategy. It's a very complicated function, but it's the same for all these strategies. So this is great, because then I can compare this strategy without knowing what C of T is. So, so what counts really is the expectation of R of T of the revenue, okay? When we if we if we compare two strategies, okay. Now, I am going to compare the expected revenue of the classical Cephish mining uh, that is exposed in the AR serial paper with the revenue of honest mi mining, okay? SM is selfish mining. It's just the, 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 the strategy that they, they, they present in the first paper, academic paper, or other discussion before. So this is what happens. At the beginning, you keep withholding blocks, and the expected value of the revenue is negative. It's negative, and up to some point, so this is uh, on the number, the number of difficulty adjustments. The unit here in the x-axis is the number of difficulty adjustment. When you hit the first difficulty adjustment, then you know is it, the, 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 the revenue you know is, 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 is negative. It means that it's less than the honest revenue, but then it, it, it starts to improve. And then you get a linear improving, and it means that about the fifth. Uh, so this this computed. Sorry, I haven't indicated this in the picture, but this is for computed for, for a hash rate of about 10%. You have a 10% hash rate, this is what happens. You need to wait five difficulty adjustments in order to have a profitable Debian strategy of selfish mining. And five difficulty adjustments is not exactly 10 weeks because you know, you slow down. The, the principle here is that is you are not being profitable, but you are slowing down the network. And then when the first difficulty adjustment hits, you become more profitable than honest mining. Okay? This is what then you recover your revenue, but you need at least 10 weeks with 10% of the hash rate. So, you know, this is enough to understand why this strategy is not 
been seen because, I mean, in 10 weeks, people realize what is happening. Yeah, and gamma, 90%. Ah, gamma, you mean the connecting parameter. Yeah, I haven't talked about the connecting parameter, but yeah. So, but, but, but anyway, for, for just some very high hash rate, 10% the high hash rate and, and reasonable parameters, this is the picture you get, okay, for selfish mining. Okay. So there are more misunderstandings in the, in the literature. So people, people not only understand, not understand the, this profitability model, but they, they even claim that it's wrong. And what they say is the following. There's a paper of Neji, Reason, and Serer, which, which uh, well, I don't know, Reason is a physicist, so he should, have, should know math. The others are kind of computer science guys. But they, they, in, this, in this paper, <laughs> they, they don't understand these basics of this profitability analysis, and they, they, they claim that our computations were wrong. Say, so, well, you know, if you claim that our computations are wrong, tell me where it's wrong. Of course, our computations are not wrong. I mean, not only they are checked uh, mathematically, but uh, when you do run simulations, you can you can see that they fit with the simulations exactly. And uh, and but no, they say that it's wrong because they say, you know, we have another uh, strategy that they name in term itself is mining that proves that uh, you know that. Uh, before, you know, it consists in switching to honest mining after the first difficulty adjustment and proving that it's more profitable than what the, the, the precisely the, the Martingale analysis shows. So, so and they, they claim that this intermittent selfish mining is faster profitable than classical selfish mining. So we, we saw that for some parameters, it takes about five difficulty adjustments, so about more than 10 weeks to get it profitable, and they claim that they found another uh, strategy that makes the, the selfish mining more profitable faster. And it consists just in reaching the first uh, difficulty adjustment and then start honest mining. This is a bit strange. And indeed, we say, well, let's analyze what they're doing. And well, what, the, what is the profitability with our profitability model? You know, the, the correct profitability model, what happens in this strategy, in this intermittent selfish mining strategy? So let's analyze this strategy. So you look at the expected revenue of this strategy compared to the expected revenue of honest mining. And this is what you see. So the beginning is the same until the first difficulty adjustment, and then when you have the first difficulty adjustment, you start honest mining, then you recover very rapidly. You remember that the, the other curve was, was, going, was linear, going to five here, right? So here you recover very, very quickly. I say that's true, that you get unexpected profitability much faster in two, in two, uh, in two uh, difficulty adjustments, the strategy will be profitable in expectation, right? It's expected to be profitable. But, you know, another thing they don't understand is that the strategy is repeating it. I mean, if you have a winning strategy at the roulette, you just don't go play once, win one euro, and go back home, no? You repeat this one million times, and you, you win one million euros, okay? The, the, uh, this is a, you know, it's, it's a gambling, right? But if I play poker, I, I, I play millions of hands, and it's profitable because I play millions of hands. Maybe, maybe I, 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 am, I am new to poker and, uh, and, and I just play one hand and I win it and then I go back home. Do I have a profitable strategy? Nothing, I mean, I don't know how to play poker, I just had luck. Huh? So, so, so what is important is that once you have a strategy, you want to repeat it. So if you want really to repeat it, you need to apply it again. So you, you are going to, after the, desic, the second difficulty adjustment, you are going to, to, to do selfish mining again. So again, your profitability decreases. And then at some point, at, at the next difficulty adjustment, you start honest mining. This is their strategy. So you repeat it, right? So when you repeat it, you see this. This is the expected value of the revenue compared to honest mining. So you have this, this curve. And you see that you have to go up to, of course, it's profitable. But it only, it's only profitable for sure after 15 difficulty adjustments. 
well, indeed 13 around here. Okay, so it's about in 26 weeks for the same parameters than the others. So, I mean, these people don't understand what they are doing, talking about. I mean, it's because they are talking only about percentage of blocks in the, in the blockchain. And this is bullshit. What you need is, is, really, is, really, is really to have a, 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 a profitable per unit of time and expect a positive expected value. So you need to wait 13 difficulty adjustments and more than 26 weeks for their strategy. So it's not, it's not a good strategy. And indeed, what we prove, this we prove with Martin Gill techniques, is that this intermittent, intermittent selfish mining is always less profitable. It's slightly more profitable than honest mining, that's true, but on the long run, it's very unprofitable compared to, to selfish mining. Okay? And indeed, what we prove mathematically using Martin Gill, and there's no other way to prove it, well, yeah, probably this, this you, can, you can get it with micro chain, but uh, this, this is going to be, but of course you need to understand what you are doing, that you have to repeat the cycle. If you don't repeat the cycle, you're not analyzing a strategy. Then uh, selfish mining is more profitable than, sorry, that intermittent selfish mining is less profitable than selfish mining. When, when selfish mining is, more, I mean, and look at the situation where selfish mining is more profitable than honest mining, so you have parameters that justify using selfish mining, then in that case, you are better off using selfish mining than intermittent selfish mining. This is an, a mathematical inequality that we prove. So these are the curves. So this is the hash rate parameter, and this is the connection parameter. So you can see the, the three curves where in the region of this parameter where, where which strategies are more profitable, one than the others. Now, um, now we want to analyze this phenomena more in detail. I mean, because it's not about, you know, uh, getting a moment where it's more profitable in expectation than honest mining, but it's about having having a positive uh, expectation value compared to to, sell, to honest mining. So we introduce a, a notion that is called uh, profit lag, and for a given strategy. We want to understand this uh, stop time, it's called mathematically a stop time in probability, when the expected value is positive compared to honest mining. And this is what we call profit lag. So the profit lag of a mining strategy is the minimum time that we call tau, such that for any t larger than tau, the strategy gels a profit in expected value, okay? If we stop mining at this time, all right? I so say, well, I stop business and stop mining, and, and I want I want to be sure that I'm in the green. Okay, how long do I have to wait? So we have seen for intermittent selfish mining, we need 13 difficulty adjustments, so uh, more than 26 weeks, and uh, in 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 selfish mining, we need five difficulty adjustments, more than 10 weeks. Okay, and for any other strategy, it could be it could change, it could be different. All right, uh, if you honest mining then it's tau is equal to zero. We are compared to, to honest mining all the time. Now, there is another strategy that is more profitable than honest mining and with a minimal profit lag, and is far better than selfish mining or intermittent selfish mining. This is what we, in a third part of the paper, we discuss this, this other strategy. And we call this alternate, alternate uh, network mining. And I mean, it's a tricky strategy that indeed has been used. At the moment where there was a fork between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, there are miners that were doing that. And it's very simple. You, you are running, if you have two networks with the same, uh, you know, uh, with, with the same uh, algorithm for validating blocks, okay, then it costs nothing to point your hash rate to one network or the other. So of course you are not stupid. If one of the network has a very low difficulty, it is more profitable to mine in the, in the network which has less profitability, well, less difficulty. I mean, of course, it depends on the, on the, on the value, on the compare value of the coins, right? If the, of course, it has always been more profitable to one Bitcoin than, than one Bitcoin cash. But if you can mine faster Bitcoin Cash, then 
uh, you know, the, the hash rate will adjust. And people were doing that. They were switching from one network to another. And so uh, we, we proposed a, a, a another mining strategy that instead of intermittent selfish mining, you stop selfish mining and you start honest mining. You say, well, uh, since I have a, I have doing selfish mining and I in the first difficulty adjustment, I'm going to decrease the difficulty adjustment. Uh, that then you know it's, it's profitable to mine there, but also I have I can decrease the the difficulty adjustment in another way. I leave the network, so my hash rate goes elsewhere. So then the network is slows down, and in the difficulty adjustment, the difficulty will go down, and then I come back. So well, at the time there were another paper where people were doing, uh, how do they call this strategy, that they just stop mining. You know, they they were honest mining and then they stopped mining. And, uh, and, and in order to decrease the difficulty, and they, co they come back. But of course, this is not profitable because if you stop mining, you are not making any money. So instead of stopping mining, you go mine somewhere else. Uh, in particular, if you if you can. I mean, this this assumes that you have another network with the same uh, uh, algorithm for mining. Sorry, in the case you stop mining, you also cut the costs. Yes. Yes, but I don't care about the cost. That, that's true, that's true. But, you know, of course you mine if your revenue is higher than the cost, otherwise you don't, just to stop forever. Huh? Okay, so, so, so there's a positive difference. But you're, you're right, I mean, you, you save on the cost <coughs> if you stop mining, you don't, you don't burn electricity, but there are other costs like having the material, the hardware, etc., that you already, already have, have, have spent, right? Okay, so... Okay. Smart mining. Sorry, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's smart naming. A uh, very bad name because it's a very dumb mi mining strategy. But uh, yeah, it was called smart mi mining. <laughs> it's just to stop mining, and th that's true that you save on the. No, it can make sense in a situation where, for example, the the cost overcome the the profitability. I mean, if you you pay more for electricity than what you get for revenue, then you should stop. That is, that is optimal. <laughs> but all in these cases. Okay. It can happen at some moment, you know, imagine uh, you are mining using electricity from the network and, 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 uh, and then from, from the grid and then uh, the price of electricity jumps to a level that is not profitable, then you stop mining. This makes sense, but other, otherwise it not, does not make sense. Uh, okay, so with, with this alternate mining, you can achieve profitability after one difficulty adjustment, because you know you are you are you are, you are mining honestly one network, then you know you, you are assuming also that the networks are equilibrated. That means that the the, the amount of money that you get uh, per unit of hash rate is the same in both networks. This this tends to be true, right? People miners move from one to the other, and uh, well, this is this is what we analyze, and and this is this is better than selfish mining, and it's better than intermittent selfish mining. And it has a, a, a tau when it's profitable that is just one difficulty adjustment. So it's, it's, also, it's also better than selfish mining that was too. Okay. Well, that's it. I mean, I, you know, I, I could may have made a talk with the formulas and proving these things, etc. But you have this in the paper. And probably not everybody is interested in that. So I wanted to just communicate the main ideas of why we use this martingale technique, why we use this profitability model, and what are the results here that... Uh, that show that you know people need need to learn that. I mean, if they want to work on block withholding strategies, they need to understand these profitability models. Okay, and the moral of this story that if you if you claim that a mathematical work is wrong, so you you show where is the error. Okay, in the proof. I mean, there are proofs in mathematics. It's not just about opinions. You know, you can go and and find the error. And if you don't find, you you shut up. <laughs> Thank you. So, I have the question. Yes. Between uh, what you displayed and these formulas. So, can you. Ah, uh, well, well, well. Just point, point to these formulas. You know, it's very critical that you first study this paper about with these formulas. Otherwise, you won't understand profitability. Okay, no, wait, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no relation, no relation except that that in all these uh, analysis, uh, mathematical analysis, of course, 
uh, special functions appear and gamma functions and incomplete gamma functions and beta distributions, etc. But no, no, this is this is this is another stuff. I just wanted to make fun of of an unrelated work that is pure mathematics. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, 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 in the formulas for double spans, and, and we have a, a, a few incomplete gamma functions, etc., that, that are very much related to the asymptotics using Pernigian numbers. Well, there is a relation, of course, but it's just uh, the same mathematical objects that appear in the formulas. And I have a curiosity when you told that, okay, only using Martingales is possible to physically prove that there is no possibility. Well, which is basically the, the, the trick. Well, I mean, is 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 uh, is the formalism of Martingales? You know that you is, is the is the way is the way you know Martingales is just to look at a process and it's a Martingale. You have several specific conditions that yeah. has to be Markovian, etc. And and then you can prove what is called the main tool is do stopping time theorem, right? That it tells you that if you have a stopping time, that is also a, a well Define mathematical object it could be the moment that you get a positive profitability, etc. Then you have a theorem that tells you the expectations of these profitabilities. Okay, you don't have this with Markov chain. With Markov chain, you have just an algorithm, a chain, which is a graph, modelized by a graph, and just a linear algebra. You compute, uh, you compute what is the profitability of this particular algorithm. But okay, so you exploit basically, I don't know, the option or something theorem of Dupe. Yes. Stop yes. Yes. The yes. Time, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit a, a second course level probability, right? That usually people stop at probability distribution, this type of thing. But then, then when you when you, you study random processes, and you study Martingales for this, I mean, they are useful for this type of stuff. And 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 and, and, and I think the key point. Okay. I mean, I think the misunderstanding comes from the fact that after the difficulty adjustment, of course. Uh, there is a, a clear relation between the percentage of blocks that are that are in the blockchain and your profitability. But with Markov chain, you cannot measure how long it takes. So it may take, you know, if I take certain parameters, it may take uh, three years before you get a positive probability. And in three years, you will be broke because you have to spend money on electricity, etc. And your competitors are, are competing with you, are honest mining in a more profitable way. So what I mean is that... Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's important to understand these things that if, if you don't have the right profitability, I mean, if, you, if your goal is to maximize the number of blocks, the percentage of blocks in the blockchain is not the right objective. The objective is to maximize the amount of money you make per month. Okay, that's it. And, and then, of course, to minimize the time it, it, you, you get to something that is more profitable than honest mining. Okay, there are different parameters. This is why we introduced this this uh, this lag uh, lag uh, you know stopping time. And why are you interested in the limit of the revenue per time? Oh well, once once you get once you get uh, a strategy that works, you want to know you know in, in the long run how much it, how much it, you will profit from it. Will you get a ten percent or a one percent profit extra profit, right? This is very important because because I mean this is basic in, in mathematical finance. You know, once once you get something that is profitable uh, in the long run, you want to know how much profitable it is because this will tell you how, how much you can scale these these operations. Hmm? The same in gambling. I mean, if you if you are a good poker player, you know how much money you make at the end of the year, and you know which levels of tables you can make. You you, you can manage your bankroll. I mean. And you, of course, you need to control also the volatility. So, in, in some sense, we are controlling the volatility at the beginning here, with this this this, uh, this profit lag parameter, this profit lag notion. We know that when you deviate at the beginning, because of the theorem we have, you are less profitable than honest mining. So, so what you want to know how fast you are going to recover. Okay. More questions? Well. I mean, so so it's not very mathematical. Just explain the idea. So people that want to know the, the the formulas, they just go and get the paper and look at it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.